Welcome and thank you all for attending the Trail Talks tonight. Um, I'm Ahmad Mirza, I'm a librarian here with the Santa Barbara Public Library. Um, before we begin, I wanna make a few announcements. Um, if you register for the event on the library's calendar, uh, you should get an email with the webinar information. Uh, if you're placed on the wait list, because these things get popular, we will not forget you, um, but still do register because that way you'll get the link sent to you uh, for the presentation, the live uh, webinar. Um, it'll get sent to you uh, the day of the event. So even if it looks full, if it's in the webinar, we can still get the link to you. Um, don't let it fool you. Um, and uh, we wanted to also send a big thank you to James Wapatich, uh, who is our library partner uh, for these Trail Talk series. Um, just a big, 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 big thank you to James. If you see James, tell him thank you from us. Um, <laughs> thank you that we he's hosting these, uh, assist us with it. Uh, asset to not only the library, but to the community, the county um, as a whole. So we really appreciate you, James. Um, and if anyone's here is interested in following James's adventures, which you all should be interested in, uh, do check out James's blog, www.songsofthewilderness.com. That's a great blog. Check it out, www.songsofthewilderness.com. Appreciate you, James. Um, another quick announcement. It's uh, the next Trail Talks is on the library's calendar. Um, May 19th, uh, markup now, uh, you can register it for, um, register for it now, actually it's, it's open, it's available. Um, and that one's going to be, uh, tending the homescape, uh, traditional ecological worldviews in Sukston. And that is with Julie Cordero, uh, May 19th. Um, I want to say to anyone who has any questions during the presentations to please put them in the chat. Um, at the end of the presentation, we'll try to get to all your questions or most of the questions. Um, the presentation is going to be recorded um, and it is going to be uh, put on the library's YouTube page. That's why, again, looping back, it's good to register even on the wait list because you'll get the links and you'll get the updates as well that, hey, it got uploaded to YouTube. Um, and there we go. Um, shifting gears here. Um, Sweet, got through all those announcements. Check our library calendars for upcoming events as well. We have the book to action, uh, a lot of themes with the Channel Island happening um, and uh, definitely check it out. I'll follow up probably with the YouTube link once, uh, once this is on YouTube with information of upcoming events regarding the book to action, um, things coming up on our calendar. Um, I have the pleasure uh, tonight of introducing Field Ranger, Helen Tarbett. Uh, Helen has been with the Forest Service for 24 years in the Santa Lucia Ranger District and has managed the wildflower program there for 20, over 21, 22 years, uh, which she started to help the public uh, know what kinds of wildflowers to expect in the Figueroa Mountain area. Each spring, um, she provides regular updates to the public on what's currently in bloom and where to find them and has helped design a handy printable wildflower guide that can be found on the Forest Services website. And I'm gonna actually put it in the chat, the link uh, to this guide um, multiple times. So if you're coming in and out, it, it'll be there and you email us, we'll send it also the link to it once we sent the video out to everyone who's registered, um, you'll get the link as well. So we're gonna bombard you with this link <laughs> that you're gonna get this guide, see, get access to this guide. Um, and with that, I just wanna say thank you, Helen, for giving us uh, uh, your time today. Um, and we look forward to your talk, uh, Wildflowers of Figueroa Mountain and the Central Coast. Thanks, Helen. Thank you, Ahmad, and thank you, James, if he's on. <laughs> thank you, you so much for, <laughs> thank you so much for inviting me. Um, my name is Helen Tarbett and I work with the Forest Service, as Ahmad mentioned. Uh, I, my wildflowers have always been my passion. Actually, you know what? I, let me go back. I, they really weren't my passion up to, till about 22 years ago um, when I noticed that people were really interested in them. So at that point, when I realized this and I thought, you know what? I'm going to do something about this because I really didn't know what the flowers were. So I decided I'm going to learn these flowers and I'm going to be able to tell people, oh, that's a lupin or that's a poppy, right? So I basically started learning them. And the next thing you know, it became my passion. And since then, I just love 
working among the flowers, working with people. I love doing these updates. I love sharing where these flowers can be found, uh, sharing my knowledge about them as well. You know, the, you know, I'll tell you right off the bat, I'm not a, I'm not a scientist. So the flowers that you'll see and the PowerPoint that I have for you, um, basically they just have the common names because my, the, you know, my program is intended for people like myself, you know, that, that really don't know the scientific names that just want to know the, the common names so that I can go out and find these flowers and enjoy them and know what they are. So um, anyway, I, I'll start off by telling you that um, this year for the flowers, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but because of the weather, we really didn't have all that many flowers. I mean, we have them right now, we have a few, some, and in fact, I really think that as of last week, they were peaking, but even with the peak, there really aren't that many this year. Um, that was because of the very strange year that we had weather-wise. We had all of this rain that came in in December. And at that point, I thought, oh my goodness, this is a good sign. We're probably gonna have a great flower year. We might even have a super bloom year. Well, unfortunately, by January, all the rain stopped. <clears throat> it didn't give the, the flowers the opportunity to really turn into gorgeous, beautiful blooms like they normally would. Um, because they do need the rain, they need the constant rain during the rest of the winter. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be hard rain, but it has to be some rain throughout the winter in order for them to continue to grow and so that they can blossom when they, during the time that that certain variety blossoms. And then after they finish their bloom and, they, and they're out for a while, then they, you know, they will die off and then they'll spread their seeds for next year. Well, this year they were so confused because of the lack of rain that they took what they could. They basically, some of them bloomed really, really, really early. A good example are the chocolate lilies. They came in super early. And they came in actually like late February, early March, which is super early for them. Uh, and they, and basically what they did is that they came in, they were super small, super tiny, and they bloomed. They only lasted about maybe four or five days. Then they died out. They went into seed and that was it for them. Uh, we didn't have the big glorious skills like we would normally have. The same with the poppies. Uh, poppies have been, in fact, all the flowers for that matter, they've all been pretty small. They've been very, very tiny because they haven't had the rain to really, you know, get tall. So they're tiny, they're short, and they're very small. And uh, anyway, the poppies did the same thing. Nothing really, that we have some poppies, but nothing compared to what we would have on a good year. Um, what I thought we'd do is we would go over this PowerPoint that I have. I have quite a few of the flowers, of the flower pictures, not of this year, but they are from years past. And you'll see what I mean as we go along this PowerPoint. Uh, all of these pictures were taken during very good flower years. And so anyway, why don't we do that? And then after that, we can uh, go into questions because you'll probably have questions for me. So this first picture, is Figueroa Mountain Wildflowers, right? And this picture that you see is of Grass Mountain. Well, it doesn't look at all like that this year. This year, it's very bare. Okay, I mean, even the grass has really, it's pretty much curing. Uh, basically, when it cures, it, it turns brown. And so it's happening right now. Um, there, were, there was no orange to speak of this year because the poppies just didn't make it up there. Um, the flowers down below are called gold fields. Really, we, we just had a little sprinkling of them, nothing like this. These are carpets of them, and we didn't have any of that. So this, you know, most of these pictures were taken, uh, oh, probably 2017, 18, 19. Okay, so it was, they were pre-pandemic. So anyway, we'll go on to the next one. These are some of the first flowers that come out. They're called milkmaids, also no, known as toothwoods. They're called that because if you look at the cute little shape, they look like little teeth. And those are some of the first flowers that you'll see during the season. They like to grow in shaded areas, shady areas, I should say. Then we have buttercups, another popular variety that's 
that is early on. And this one kind of lingers throughout the, the season. They're, they, they're cute, they're really pretty. They have a shiny leaf to them. Then we have the shooting stars, which is another early variety. They're absolutely gorgeous and they come in quite a range of colors from white to deep burgundy. Here's another shooting star. And if you'll notice, when they go to seed, they become these little round circle things. That's where all the seeds are. And then once the whole flower dries, then this one will open and it scatters the seeds. So that the next year when it blooms, then that field will look like this. Okay, so, can you see the color in this one? These, these are more of the white. This is another early variety called the Johnny Jump Up. And they're from the Petunia family. And they are just cute as could be. They're darling. They grow again in the shaded areas. Western peonies. You know, you don't see them that often, but we do have them up on Figueroa Mountain. And they're they're really pretty. They, like I said, you really don't see them that often, but they are they are around. I didn't see any this year. <clears throat> oh, Ahmad, here's the chocolate lily. These are chocolate lilies. They are, uh, they're actually the ones that I was telling you about earlier, but these aren't the ones, but this is the variety. Uh, this is a good year. If you'll notice, they're real tall and the flowers are pretty, they're very good size. They're probably about maybe two inches. This year, they didn't make it to that. And, um, this is this one has like three flowers blooming on the one on the one plant. This year they were lucky to have one. Uh, this was a, like I said a few years back. This is a field of them, and this year we had no fields at all with these. This one's a hummingbird sage. Hummingbird sage is so beautiful. You know what's funny is that it's not really a sage, but it's called a hummingbird sage. Um, Hummingbirds love them, hence their name, hence its name, but you know, hummingbird sage. Uh, they're beautiful, they attract insects, they attract hummingbirds, and they're just a very stunning flower. They grow tall, and then these little flowers grow within the brackets of them. So I'm sure you've seen them, they're very lovely. There's a close up of it. And then we have Blue-eyed grass. Um, I'm sorry, this isn't blue-eyed grass. I'm lying to you. These are blue dick. And uh, basically, this isn't a very good picture of it. I kind of extended it so it doesn't really show the fullness of the flower itself. The next one will show more. But basically, they're little, they're bulbs, actually. And they grow, they have absolutely no leaves on it, except this flower grows at the very top with a bunch of little flowers. So it's a little ball with purple on them and they, they've got little, a bunch of little flowers at the top and uh, they're beautiful. And during, back in the, in the Western days, right? The bulb is edible. So what the cowboys would, would do was that they would get miner's lettuce and then they would dig out the bulbs of the blue dick. They would cut them up and they'd make a salad. So there's, there's a couple more blue dick and them with a swallowtail butterfly on it. They're, they love, they love all of these flowers. You see them around during spring and into summer. And here's the other part of the salad. Here's the miner's lettuce. Then we talked earlier about the gold fields. That's what this, you know, these are gold fields and that's, and hence their names, they feel, they, they just make the fields look like gold. Uh, because when we, during a good year, they just completely spread in fields and they grow and they look beautiful. They're tiny, they're tiny, tiny little flowers. But when you have so many of them growing all together, it creates like a carpet of them. Kind of like what the poppies do as well during a good year. And this was a good year for them. This was, I wanna say that this was back in 2019, I believe, but I, I might be wrong, I can't remember. But anyway, uh, poppies are very popular at Figueroa. 
uh, they're popular all over the Central Coast, but Cal but up in Figueroa, they have been known to do beautiful, beautiful displays. And um, anyway, so that's, here's another picture of them at Figueroa from, this is also uh, another, that was the same year I took the, the first one. And um, anyway, here's the mountains, you know, grass mountain that's pretty much covered with, with the uh, uh, poppies. And this one's just the inside of a poppy. I thought it would, it would look pretty, so I added it. <laughs> okay. Then we have lupin. Oh, lupin grow all over the Central Coast. And, you know, we have actually, I want to say about five varieties up at Figueroa Mountain. This is known as the sky lupin. Beautiful. They, they grow in fields and they're just absolutely beautiful. Then we have arroyo lupin. Arroyo lupin is also very beautiful. And you can tell the difference between the arroyo and the sky lupin because of the leaves. If you notice the leaves on the arroyo are much thicker and wider than, than the sky lupin. You see the sky lupin is not, the leaves are not that big at all. The color is also different. Then we have the bush lupin. That's what's really going strong right now up at Figaro, up at Figaro are the, are the bush lupin. They're absolutely beautiful. And you know, another thing about lupin, oh my goodness, they, they actually produce the most amazing smell. So as you're driving during the time that the lupin are blooming, you have to have your windows open and just take in the absolutely beautiful smell that they produce. Okay, that's what that's one of my favorite things to do. There's another tiny lupin. This one's called a miniature lupin. And like its name calls it, it's tiny. They're teeny, teeny little things. They don't grow very far. The flower is very tiny. And the leaves, as you can see, they're very, very tiny as well. Then we have stinging lupin. And as the name says, they sting, right? <laughs> These grow in disturbed soil. So usually it's like hillsides, especially for some reason after like a, if there's like a slide or something, they love growing in, in whatever soil they find that is disturbed. And they're beautiful, but don't ever do what I did when I first saw it. And I thought, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take it back to the office and identify it. I went to grab it and oh my gosh, I was picking out little cactus-like pins off my fingers for days. But anyway, they, these are more on the maroon side, um, burgundy type of flower. They're very beautiful. But again, you know, don't touch them. <laughs> and then the other uh, lupin that we have up at Figaro is called a coulter lupin. It's not quite as dashing as the other lupin. In fact, this one's kind of um, very plain. It's not as full as the other lupin, but it's still different. and. Um, if you, you could tell that it actually produces like almost two different colors. And that's what really makes it different. But it's, they're, like I said, they're not as stunning as the other types of lupin. And to be honest with you, I don't even really think that they produce an, a smell because I've never really smelled these, uh, the, the cultures, but they're still beautiful. And they are part of the most beautiful mountain, in my opinion, Figueroa Mountain. Then we have another one that's a very charming flower. It's the fuchsia flowering gooseberries. A lot of people refer to them as earrings, an earring plant. And you can see why people would look at them as, a, as an earring. Um, they are also, they usually come out not really towards the beginning of the flower season, but just right after it. And uh, they're, they're charming, they're beautiful, and they do grow at Figaro. Then we have another one. This one resembles the blue dick, but it's actually called a blue globe gilia. And again, like the blue dick, it also grows straight, but it has, but this one does have little leaves at the bottom. But if you can know, if you'll notice, it's got individual little flowers. Uh, bees, butterflies, they absolutely love these. And again, you can find those at Figueroa. Another one that's very popular, not just at Figueroa, but everywhere, is the Lomatium. 
this is a uh, this one grew, this is part of the parsley family i believe if i'm not mistaken it grows slow to the ground and they have like little tiny tons of little flowers and these little squatted looking uh pads almost and um so those you have to look for when you're actually out there and looking on the ground this other one is also in bloom right now it's called the bush poppies and they're absolutely gorgeous. You can find these along. Um, it's that that location between uh, Ranger Peak and Kachuma Saddle up on Figaro Mountain. These are in bloom right now with the bush lupin. Bush lupin is lining the roads in many areas. And the bush poppies are actually growing along the hillsides. So the contrast between the beautiful purple lupin and the and then the 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 rocky areas are more of like a brownish red and then you've got these brilliant yellow poppies and it just makes such a beautiful display and that's what's happening right now that's like our biggest display right now then we have baby blue eyes oh i just love these little guys aren't they cute anyway baby blue eyes uh they call them that because they're tiny and they're Yes, I think I've seen them maybe up to an inch, but they usually don't go beyond that. And, you know, they're normally blue. Sometimes they're a pale blue, but they're usually blue. Sometimes they can come out to almost like a very pale purple, but it's, but usually they are blue. They're found in shady areas as well. These are wild canyon peas. And again, these are found in shaded areas. Uh, they are from the pea family. Owl's clover. I have not seen owl's clover in a couple of years. Um, on good years, they basically bloom in, in, you know, in large fields and they're absolutely stunning because they are like a, like a light purple, as you could see. Um, but this year, last year, I didn't see them. Hopefully next year we might be able to see them. These are related to the Indian paintbrush, which is this one and which we also find at Figueroa. And they, the, and however, these, unlike the bush lupin, I'm sorry, the bush lupin, unlike the owl's clover that grows usually in like fields or, or I've seen them in fields. I've actually seen them in, in dirt areas as well. But the Indian paintbrush will actually grow more so in rock, rocky areas. They like the rock around them and they like to grow between the rock and stuff. And also, these can be seen in bright red. You could see them in pink. You could see them um, in like a light red. I've even seen yellow ones up at Figaro. Then we have the beautiful, beautiful Catalina mariposa lilies. Uh, beautiful flower that grows among the grass and full sun. Um, they were still active as of last Friday at Figaro. They were still blooming in the fields as you're going up and also going up Figaro Mountain Road and also as you were coming back down on Sunset, uh, Abbey Canyon. This one is called a death camas. It's also a bulb plant. And the reason they call it a death camas is because they're highly toxin, toxic. And uh, so anyway, it's not a good idea to, to grab them and think, oh, I'm gonna take a bite of it because <laughs> it's not really good for them. It's not good for the animals either. The other one that's really bad for horses is the fiddle neck. And they're beautiful. They're lovely and they grow in beautiful fields. But again, it, this is basically a, a rancher's nightmare really because they don't, they don't like to have these in their fields because if the horses eat them, it could actually kill a horse. Oh, this is one of my favorite flowers. Uh, it's called a clematis. And the reason it's my favorite, it's <laughs> because of its transformation. This is the flower stage that it goes through. <clears throat> when they're in full bloom, this is what they look like. <clears throat> and they're beautiful. They, they pretty much grow in bushes. And it's this beautiful flower that's probably about maybe three inches. 
three to four inches, just depending on, on the weather and, and what the climate has been like that year, whether it's they get a lot of rain or not. And then after they go to seed, they turn into these beautiful little pom-poms. Isn't that amazing? And that's the seed pod. So just something about the transformation that makes them one of my favorites because they're so different. Okay, this is a, wall, a wallflower. Uh, it grows a Figueroa. I've also seen it in other locations in the Central Coast. Um, in Figueroa, they're, they're an orange color. In other locations, they're yellow. But they're a lovely flower. And like its name says, they basically just grow by themselves, right? And they usually grow like apart from each other. So they're pretty much by themselves. And uh, you might see a field of them, but none of them are really close together. They're pretty much away from each other. This other flower is called a sticky monkey flower. Uh, they also come in orange and they also come in yellow. These are blooming right now up on that one stretch between Ranger Peak and Kachuma, where the lupin are in full bloom right now and, the, and so are the bush poppies. These are also starting to come out. And so once again, we have another tone. The ones that the figure are, are, are like in between an orange and a yellow. And so when those come out, they make such a great contrast and a beautiful flower. Reason they're called sticky monkey flowers is because the leaf is sticky. This one is a seep spring monkey flower. Uh, another beautiful flower from the monkey flower family. These, these are more apt, you're more apt to find these in areas that are a little, that are a little damp. Um, they like water, so you'll more than likely find them in riparian areas or like if there's an underground spring that where it's constantly being fed and it's kind of moist, you're gonna find these there. Then you have the common phacelia. Um, what makes phacelia so beautiful is that they grow in like a, in, in like a little circle. So it looks almost like a, like a caterpillar because when they, when they all flower, they have like this little caterpillar shape that kind of curls. And the flowers are so lovely. They're beautiful. Um, there's another one from the same family that's called the caterpillar phasalia. And those are more on the white side, but these are the common ones. And we, some people refer to them as blue phasalia. Some refer to them as purple phasalia, but they are actually the common ones. These are the prickly phlox. Um, we didn't have very many this year, and usually we get quite a few of those during a during a even an average year. We have quite a few prickly phlox, and this year we didn't have very many. Um, they can be a dark pink, or they could be a light pink, or I've even seen them almost like like a purplish as well. But there are, and these grow in bushes. Then there's the beautiful chia. I love chia. You've heard of chia seeds, right? Well, this is actually where the seeds come from, is the chia plant. And these grow in sunny locations, normally in rocky areas. This is a vetch. And this particular one is called a hairy vetch. And it's from the pea family. It's an absolutely beautiful plant. And uh, this one, I've actually seen these grow in both sunny locations and in shady areas and stuff. So they're not particular. <laughs> and, they, and again, they are from the, from the uh, legume family. So they are being, the type of bean. Oh, and this is another one of my favorite flowers. It's called the Fiesta flowers. Um, they're beautiful purple flowers. And the reason they got their name is because they grow very, very much. They grow, they grow quite a bit in Mexico. So back in the day, back back when the day when ranchers, after they you know, had a really busy season, they would have these fiestas, these parties, right? Well, the ladies would make their own dresses because they really didn't have the money to go and buy a fancy dress. So they would make their own attire. They would make their own clothes. And, but you know, they really didn't have anything to embellish them with. 
So they would take these flowers and they're sticky. Okay, the leaves are sticky. So they would take the flowers and they would position them on their clothing and they would stay. So that's where they got the name Fiesta Flowers. Now, when I first read about this, I thought, that can't be so. That's not really true. So I asked my dad, who is from Chihuahua, Mexico, and he grew up on a ranch. And I asked him if that was true, if he had ever heard of that. And he said that they absolutely are. I can't remember the name that he gave them in Spanish. But anyway, but he says that, yes, that's exactly what people used to do back then. Then we have the Dudlia. You know, some people call it the hen and chicks. It's a, it's a succulent that grows out in the rocky areas. And um, when the little chicks bloom, they are a beautiful reddish. They can be reddish, they can be orange. They're really pretty flowers that come out of them. Sometimes they're yellow. And then these are Chinese houses. Um, if you notice, they, they have like different layers in them. They kind of resemble a little pagoda. So that's where they got the name of Chinese houses. They're beautiful. They do love to be in the shade as well. And they also come out in different colors. This one's the purple variety. This one is the pink one. This year, they didn't get like all the, the rest of the flowers. They didn't get very big at all. They're very, very tiny. They didn't last long either. Okay, another group of flowers that are popular towards the end of the flower season are Clarkias. That's when you usually know that the wildflowers are coming to an end, uh, when the Clarkias start coming out. Okay, and they're beautiful, very, very uh, delicate looking flowers. This one's called a wine cup, Clarkia. For obvious reasons, it looks like a little wine cup. It's tiny. They're usually pretty small and they're tiny. They look like a little cup. This was called the four spot Clarkia. And you can see that each leaf, had, or not leaf, but each petal has a, a spot in it. Then we have a, <laughs> this one is called an elegant Clarkia. I don't know where it got its name, but I think it's kind of funny. To me, it looks like like something that you would find in outer space, like a satellite or something. <laughs> they're beautiful, the color is beautiful, but uh, you know they're very different, very different from any of the other Clarkias, um, but they're called elegant Clarkias. Again, I don't know why. <laughs> and then these are called punch bowl Clarkias, also known as farewell to spring. Like I said, they look, they're very, they're very delicate, they're beautiful. And you know, it's, it's said that once these, you start seeing these, that pretty much flowers are over and spring is just about over. You know, that's, that's what they say. This is another one of my favorites. This, these are called fairy lanterns. Uh, you know, it's like from the first time I saw it, saw these, I was intrigued with them because I could almost close my eyes and imagine being in a mystical forest with little, with little fairies running around with these little things for light. And anyway, they've always been one of my favorite flowers and they're actually out right now. There, there aren't that many, but we do have some right now. And then these are the wild roses. Another beautiful flower, those in fact, Last week they weren't in bloom yet, but I'm assuming that these probably will start blooming by next week, I think. Might be wrong. And then the final one that I have here are filleries. These little purple flowers, they are not indigenous to California. They're not indigenous to the, to the United States, but they've been around since the 1800s. Um, and you know what, they grow at Figueroa, and so I always include them. I include all the flowers that I see out there, whether they're indigenous or not, I always include them because, you know, people still want to know what they are. And then this flower is called a painted lady. So anyway, this is the end of the slideshow. But uh, anyway, I don't know. Ahmad, any questions? Uh, yeah, there are some, there are some questions. Um, let me... 
get through them. I actually um, want to see if I could share. I want to actually, I, I included the link in the chat to Helen's wildflower guide. And I actually want to share it on screen if I can. And <laughs> just kind of give everyone a little visual of, of, of how awesome this guide is. And, and, and maybe Helen, you could give a little bit of um, insight into um, your thought process, how the design of it. So let me, um, um, I like, I want to add, I like that it's color connected <laughs> with the colors of the plants. That's, that's really cool. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Tell me if everyone can see this here. Does that work? Yeah. Yes. So are you able to see that Helen there? Yes, but you know what though? This is, there's actually another one. Okay, so I pulled this one off of the okay. site. Yeah, there's another one that's, gosh, I don't know that I can get to it right now or not without losing you. Okay. Do is you it, I, um, um, I don't know. I, I don't want to lose you, so I'm afraid to. I don't think okay. I better we'll, risk we'll it. Make sure we'll send the link for the, the mm -hmm. updated one, but this one is okay. one that still is could be used oh you know what jennifer just put something on there jennifer okay. works with me okay let me and, pull it up here. and yeah so jennifer okay. just yeah let me hey this one looks cooler too okay hold on <laughs> bring that one up. i got it um did, did you get thank, it did jennifer send it to you yeah uh oh good thank you jennifer okay let's let me do this here like this how does that one look there perfect okay yes um, yes, this is the this is the actual one. This is the current. But um, yeah, so you know, it's pretty much you know when I first came up with my first guide, it was just I was just I just had all these flowers put together in, in this sheet and stuff, and then we had an acting ranger uh, that saw it and she thought it was a great idea and she really liked it. And said, you know what, Helen, do you mind if I come up with something that might show it off a little more? Well, as you know, Ahmad, I am not that computer savvy, you know. <laughs> no, you're doing well. You're doing well. <laughs> and uh, so, of course, I told her, please do it, right? And so she took it and she made that first one that you showed. Yeah. So, so she came up with that Good one thing. and it was her idea to actually color coordinate them. Okay. And I fell in love with what she did. And so we kept that going. And so then later when, you know, we, we got more involved in it and stuff, and then it went up to our regional office, uh, to our designer, and he, you know, he basically did all, he did all the rest. I mean, all the pictures, if you'll notice between the two, they're pretty much the same. There might be extra ones in this one, but, you know, you can see that that's how we pretty much got it. That's how we came to being. It was, it was a combined, a combined effort. Of like several people. No, it's a really, it's a really good guide. Um, I mean, just visually, and you're out there, and I just know the type of person. At least I am. Would be flipping through, <laughs> like, like, okay, here. So, um, okay, so yeah, as give as that hopefully has given some people some time to put in their ch uh, questions in the chat. Um, there was um, uh, questions on. Um, oh, you know what, Jennifer just also sent you the. No, what did you send, Jennifer? No, uh, so I don't think that's I don't think that's the, the new one, Je Jennifer. That the new one is from April was from last week. I think it's April 18th. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um uh so one of the questions came up. Is there any um ideal trails um in the Figueroa mountain area that you can get a good, you know, from start to finish, maybe get some good wildflower experience on a normal year i would say yes but this year they're very minimal uh ballard let's see is this the new one helen april 18th yes that's it jennifer mm -hmm. um but basically the ballard trail is a really really good one what conditions are needed for a super bloom well you know you do need a lot of rain during the during the winter. And then it has to continue on during the rest of the winter, but usually it has to start like in November 
and December, and then it has to continue on. Even if it's not solid, it still has to continue on so that the flowers can get that push. And as you all know, we haven't had that in several years. Um, uh, Helen, there was a question on um, the poppies. Uh, let me see if I get to it. Uh, do you happen to know why some California poppies are yellow and others are orange? You know, it's a different type of poppy. Okay. Um, usually the yellow ones, if you'll notice at the, you know, the, well, let me go back. The, the regular California poppies, you know, the big orange ones, they have like a little, like a little bib underneath it, right? And then the yellow ones usually don't. And those are called tuft poppies, T-U-F-T poppies. And they're, they tend to be smaller and they're, they're missing that little bib underneath it. So it's just a different variety. Do we ever see, this is another question here, do we ever see Indian warrior in oak woodlands common in Northern California? You know, I have never seen an Indian warrior at Figueroa. I have seen them in Pozo. I have pictures of them, but all those pictures that I have of the Indian warriors have been up at Pozo, in the Pozo area. Here, they th I think they you know they tend to like more of like the deserty climate, and that's what Pozo is. Um, let's see here. I guess this, there's some questions of uh, being uh, people that are new to Santa Barbara. Um, would be a good which. Which, which street should I take to drive up to the mountains to see the wildflowers? Um, the, the best way to get to Figueroa is off of the 154, right across from Los, uh, from Los Olivos, yes. There's Figueroa Mountain Road. And if you follow Figueroa Mountain Road all the way down until you make this little, you, you turn into this little bridge, go over the bridge, that's where my update starts. Jennifer, I think, posted the, the new one a little bit ago. That one was the one that I put out last week. But the way that, that the, the wildflower update is intended, it's intended to be like a driving type of tour. So basically, you get, uh, you, get to, you know, tell you, starting at the bottom of the hill, this is what you'll look for. And so you start looking for the flowers that I list on there. And then you start going up the hill. So you go up that street, Figueroa Mountain Road, and you just follow that all the way around until you get to the other side. At that point, you can, if you turn left, you go to Sunset Valley. If you turn right, you go Happy Canyon. And then you end up back, you know, once you turn onto Happy Canyon, then you end up back on 154. Okay, we'll go right here, see if the questions are popping up. Um, I know like you you touched upon the different you know well the spring and is there i know it's weather conditions but like even if it's like a poor weather um and we talked earlier about them just being like kind of there and then do their thing and then they're going like is there an ideal time even under like drought conditions to does the window yeah but you know all the flowers, you know, what people will ask me all the time, when is, when is, when are the flowers peaking? Well, there's no answer to that. There really isn't because all the flowers peak at different points. Okay. When I said earlier that the flowers are peaking at this point, I'm talking about the, the bush lupin and the, the uh, bush poppies, because those are really in bloom right now. And I really think they've reached their peak. And the only reason I can I feel that it is their peak at this point is because I see that there's a lot of seeds already. A lot of the flowers are turning to seed. So that usually signifies that they've reached their peak and they're ready to seed. And, um, but like I said, all flowers have different stages. So like when we talked earlier about the, the chocolate lilies, right? Usually chocolate lilies come in a little bit later in the season and then they will bloom and they'll normally hang out for, you know, a few weeks, you know, two, three weeks. But like I said, this year, it wasn't going to happen that way. It just, they came in, did their thing, 
and they left. It was all within a matter of, you know, I was there like from one week to the next and they did their thing within that week. Wow. <clears throat> because of the lack of rain. But if they have constant rain during this time, <clears throat> even though it's not like every, every day, but let's say they have one week of rain, they, they have another week of dry, another week of rain, another week of dry, then they're still getting watered and they're still getting the moisture that they need to be able to produce these gorgeous, beautiful blooms. Um, there was a question on um, sages <laughs> on Figueroa or is it, is it dry enough? Yes, right now what we have in bloom, um, let's see, we, we do have the purple sage that's in bloom right now and the black sage, they, they're both actually in bloom. And then of course we have the regular sage that's used for, you know, for making the, you know, the Native Americans use them for making the, the, clarif the cleansing, the, I'm not really sure the name of it, but um, I haven't seen any blooms on that one because that, that one usually doesn't bloom till much later in the, in the summer. But uh, yeah, no, so we, but we do have blooms, I mean, uh, sages right now. <clears throat> the other thing we also have are thistle. There's quite a bit of thistle that's growing right now. Of course, most thistle is not uh, native. We do have one thistle that is native. Actually, we have several, but that grows up at Figueroa. We do have the cobweb thistle, and that is native to California. Um, how? What happens to like really like invasive wildflowers or ones that like threaten other, is there something that goes well, along with that? A really good example of one of those would be like Scottish broom. That could be extremely, that could be very, um, it could be bad for the environment because it has a tendency to spread. I know one year we had so much of it that we actually had, we were out there pulling it out from the roots. I mean, it's like we were out there because we didn't want it to spread anymore. So we did have quite a few of us. Every time we'd see some growing, we'd run out there and pull it out. And when it, there was so much of it, it was, it was hard to do, but we tried to do the best we can. And I think we got it because I haven't seen Scottish, Scottish broom in a long time. There's one that kind of looks like it, but it's not. It's called uh, deer vetch, but it's not at all like Scottish, Scottish broom. But some people have told me, oh no, you've got it growing there, but it's not. It's the uh, Dear Vetch. Um, a question, <clears throat> are there any local wildflower guidebooks that you recommend? Local, you know, all of mine, God, I should have brought them out here so I could show you. Uh, all of mine that I have are just the ones that are for the Western United States. Um, gosh, darn, there is one that's put out by this one, I wanna say it's put out by Cal Poly but it's a very thin book, but it has pretty much all the flowers that grow in San Luis, but a lot of those will also grow on, you know, in Santa Barbara as well. <clears throat> um, I, I know you touched upon some of the, I guess like rarer or like exclusive ones that are hard to see or find out there. Are, can you, do you know just off the top of your head, like a, just a list of like a few of them that um, it's like a treat if you can, you could spot it out there. Oh, okay. <clears throat> One of my favorites is the tiger lily, but you know what? You have to go along the Creek to actually find that. Um, the tiger lilies are hard to locate, but they are out there. Um, usually they don't start blooming till about May or June. Again, this year, I don't, I doubt that it's going to be a very good year for them either, but when we do have a good year and we're lucky to see them, we will, they grow to be like six feet tall. Wow. You know, the stalk grows to be about six feet tall. And then they've got all of these beautiful tiger lilies coming out of it. So they're, they're gorgeous. They're orange. And then they've got like little dots and they're just absolutely gorgeous. So if you ever happen to see one of those, that's a treat, right? The other thing that's also a treat, and we only see this after a fire, uh, they're called fire lilies. I'm sorry, fire poppies. And for some reason, they only happen after a fire. And they are, they're actually a red poppy. They're much um, more delicate looking than your actual poppy. But again, you only see those during, during a, you know, once a fire goes through, you, you'll see those. 
You know, the last time I saw those was, actually, it was on, um, oh my goodness, once you pass San Luis Obispo and you're going up the grade, right? Uh, I forgot what, what it's called. The, uh, oh my God, the one that goes up to like a Tascadero, that one grade, and what, you know, where Cuesta is and all. And basically that area had burned the day, you know, like the year before. And that spring, it was like, you could see these carpets of these red flowers. Well, that's what they were. They, you know, that was, that you know, was that. One year I did see them at Figueroa, but this was a long, long time ago. We had a little fire and we did see them there. Um, let's see, what else is unusual? Gosh, I can't think of any off the top of my head other than those, but there are others. No, that's great. Um, that's a very good book. The one she's recommending. I do have that one, the Santa Barbara Foothills. I do have that. Uh, yeah. Wildflowers of the Santa Barbara Foothills mm -hmm. by David Powdrow. And yes, and I do have that one. And yes, that one is good. Um, mm -hmm. Does the Forest Service a seed or plant wildflowers? Oh. Okay. No. <laughs> that was a question. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why these are great. <laughs> blazing Star is another treat. I don't know what a Blazing Star is. So if you have a picture of one, send it to me at, at, at you know, my Forest Service address, my email address. I would love to see that. Um, there is a question over here on, are you familiar with fasciation? How much genetic lineage do the California poppies have? Um, do they mutate easily? Um, is that something with... I think there's I, a question on like the number of stems. They would have four stems or five stems. Uh, let's see. I don't know. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah, you know what? Like I said, my the program that I do is primarily for for beginners. You know, for people that just love to go out and look at the flowers and enjoy them. I do try to differentiate them if I know that there is a difference, like the poppies that I mentioned earlier. You know, I do know that there there's a difference in those, but I really couldn't tell you on this other one. Yeah, I, I, I don't. Do it. Start, stay asked. I'm not. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> I, no, it's and that's the thing. It's it's um, that's why the guide is so great. It, it's color coded. You can go out there. You <laughs> and, can match and you, it and look. It, it's right. It's, it's and you know, folks, just so that just so that you know, you know, I do the wildflower program as just part of a, a side deal that I do. You know, I have my actual job that I <laughs> that I have to do. I you know, I work fires. I work recreation. So. That's why, you know, I put as much time into the wildflower program as I can, but sometimes I end up doing it half the time on my own time. So I, that's why I really sometimes can't get into the really fine details of it. And like I said, it's become my passion, but, you know, <laughs> I can only do so much of it. No, yeah. You're going to be surrounded by all the plants <laughs> all the time. <laughs> um, we we'll See if it, any more um, golden eardrops. Um, I've never seen those. I've never seen them at Figueroa. Um, oh, so yeah, um, we'll give a, a little bit That's more sweet. time. Thank Anyone? you, Deborah. Yeah, there's a. I was gonna say, how if you scroll up, there's a, a lot of great comments, compliments um, for all the work that you do. Uh, if you That's get a sweet. chance uh, to look at them. Um, oh. No, some some nice things being said. Um, so maybe a we'll, couple more questions if anyone has any. This is more like last call for questions here. Give it give it like 30, 40 more seconds here. Um, are we are we gearing into it's kind of my question? Are we gearing into like the new plants here gonna be starting to start up here soon? The new thank you so much. <laughs> The jewel, oh yeah, you know what? I have seen jewel flowers up at Figueroa. That's another, you're right. James, you're right. That one definitely is another one that is rare to find, but I, I think I've seen them twice since I started the program. So they're not, you know where I saw it one time was down below where I called the canopy area. When you come into Figueroa and you pass that one area, it's not actually in the, on the forest yet, but it's in a very shaded area and that's where I've seen it, so. Yeah, but the jewel flower definitely. Yeah. 
Sweet. Is there anyone else there? Okay. Um, let's see. Any other name for a fairy lantern? They also call them globe lanterns. Or, I mean, globe lilies. Okay. It looked like a lantern rose. East Coast globe lilies. Okay. Um, let's see. You got those. I think it's good. You got more comp another here. Thank you, Helen. Uh, we love Fig Mountain. Yeah, Helen, you need to scroll up in the chat here and see some of the comments people have been writing for you. Uh, I'll try to save the chat for you as well. Um, Thank you. And I know we're, we're gearing up here to 630 is our, our, our time. Um, but if there's and not any more questions, I think that we can call it there. Uh, Helen, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me. No, it was a wonderful presentation. The guide is wonderful. I'm going to blast it out in the email. Um, and can you post? Yeah, I'm giving me links from uh, from Jennifer for additional. I'll blast all the links out um, when we did the video up on YouTube. Um, it was a great presentation. Um, a great talk. We really appreciate all your work, Helen. Um, and you see get all the love in the chat as well and sharing <laughs> sharing um, Thank your experience you. and your knowledge with us. Um, and um, yeah, and to everyone that's still here, the la the next um, trail talks, like I said, if you get a chance, uh, schedule, uh, put on your calendar, May 19th, it's already on the um, library's calendar. You can register for that. And that was the traditional ecological worldviews in Sixton. Um, and that's with uh, Julie uh, Cord Cordero on me, I think, um, on that. And Helen, thank you so much. Once again, we really appreciate you and your, your great presentation. Thank you so much, everyone. And Jennifer, thank you so much for your help. Yeah. I don't know what I do without you, Jennifer. You've always got my back. No, we, <laughs> Jennifer, thank you for sending those links to the <laughs> lifesaver. <laughs> yes, she's like one of my dear buddies. I love her dearly. <laughs> So if you're if you're going out, you got to take the guide with you. Don't get caught without this guide. Yeah. When you're out there, you know. And there's no reason why you can't look at something and be able to identify it. <laughs> it's there. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Helen. Thank you so much. <laughs>